Thank you all for coming. This is Hacking G Suite, the power of dark app script magic. A little bit of background on myself. I'm Matthew Bryant. Uh, you know, I go often by my handle, mandatory. I currently lead the red team effort at Snap, and um, that's my Twitter handle. I sometimes write on my blog, um, all that good stuff. So before we get into some of the more you know, technical pieces of this, I just want to give some context and background to kind of help you understand what we'll be talking about um, and kind of sort of some of the prerequisites here. One of them is uh, what's called Google Workspace. Most of you probably know this as G Suite instead. Uh, Google Workspace is basically their like fancy new rebranding of G Suite, but they are the exact same thing. And so what that is is just you know, Gmail, Docs, Slides, uh, all that good stuff together. And there's both like the public version that personal uh, accounts use, which you're probably familiar with, and then there's like the you know private enterprise company version. And the only difference is really the company enterprise version has like administration and ACL policies for the company that they can administrate. And so uh, as of the time of this research, at least they were boasting over two billion users, which is quite a few. So obviously security is a pretty important point here as well. Another prerequisite to understanding this is uh, understanding app script. So for those of you who aren't familiar, it's essentially like this really nice um, sort of like uh, way to automate Google services using JavaScript that Google's created. It's like a full sort of app making um, suite that you can use. Um, and they have all these like pre-made libraries that let you, you know, automate all everything from like docs, Gmail, whatever it is. And they have pre-made functions to make that super easy for you. And on top of that, uh, they have a really nice uh, automatic OAuth integration. So if you've ever set up like an OAuth app on Google's platform, you know, you have to set up callback URLs and like authorization URIs, all that good stuff. Uh, on App Script, when you use that, it's like kind of magic. You know, you know, sort of just, just declare the permissions you want and everything else is magically set up for you. And so you can kick off these scripts with a variety of triggers. Things like, you know, on a web request, you know, kick off a script or scheduled on a cron, all that good stuff. This is an example of what the editor looks like. You can see it's like a full IDE, um, and it's got everything from like you know libraries to you know at getting control, get, getting access to different services and you know adding triggers and all that good stuff. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Google OAuth system, uh, if you've used any other OAuth uh, you know service provided by some other company, it's basically the same thing. You know the core idea is you're a developer, you want to automate some service that people use, in this case like all of Google services. Uh, what OAuth allows them to do essentially is they can delegate access to your third party apps so that they can go out and actually use it. So say you've got some Google Docs and you want them to do some automated action on it. Uh, this allows them to basically redirect you to a permission prompt and you can say yes, it's fine that this random app accesses my Docs. And then you know your application gets back some tokens that can then actually use it to access dry, uh, Google Docs on your behalf. It has uh, over 250 scopes that you can actually allow, and this is for every single Google service under the sun. So basically, anything you can think of, there's probably a scope for it. You know, GCP, uh, Drive, whatever it is. So I talked about like an authorization prompt. This is essentially what that looks like. The idea is that it provides like sort of a human readable understanding of what they're about to grant access. Uh, so, you know, if you're some random non-technical user, you get this prompt that says like, hey, you know, example app wants to get access to your, your Gmail, Google Cloud, and it wants to run when you're not present. So the idea behind this is it gives them a very supposedly human readable way to understand what they're about to do. So kind of tying all these concepts together, uh, App Script becomes a really attractive option when it comes to attacking G Suite, especially on like the enterprise corporate level, uh, as well as like uh, it's useful for things like phishing, you know, sort of OAuth phishing attacks, as well as like you've already have access to one account in a G Suite org and you want to like persist or backdoor access in a way beyond like say you have a binary implant, this gives you another way to essentially persist. And what's really nice about App Script as opposed to sort of like the conventional like on machine stuff that you would expect, like sort of binary command access, is that uh, even if they wipe their device, you know, so they, they realize they're compromised, you know, DNR steps in, they're like, oh shoot, wipe it. Uh, you actually still maintain access uh, past that point. They have to actually go into their Google account and like actually revoke the access for this. So, you know, even if they wipe it, you're still good. <laughs> 
So uh, this is especially useful uh, when it comes to things like, you know, sort of quote unquote tough perimeters. So what, is, what do I mean by that? Um, there's kind of a growing number of companies that are getting to the point where all the fun stuff that we kind of have taken for granted over the years, things like regular credential phishing, um, you know, that Excel macros, all that good stuff, it's kind of like slowly going away with people who have hardened environments where they have, uh, you know, universal two-factor, you have to have hardware, you know, keys in order to actually log in. So, you know, regular credential phishing doesn't work. They may have things like Chromebooks. So, uh, you know, binary, you know, exploitation, like a lot of stuff isn't really tenable on an average engagement. You know, attestation, all that good stuff. And so this is, uh, becomes a very attractive option when we don't have a lot of this stuff. So to get around these measures, we're going to have to be a bit more creative. So we'll talk first about the historical precedent here. There's one particular attack that I think I'd like to mention, which gives a little bit of a, you know, a good starting point for what we're going to be talking about. So do any of you recognize this here from a few years ago? This is a uh, phishing email that went around for something that was later sort of unofficially dubbed the quote, Google Docs worm. And the way that it worked essentially is you, an unsuspecting victim, would get an email like this that says, hey, your friend wants you to like open this Google Doc that they've made. Uh, but this is not like the standard sharing email. When you actually clicked on the open in Docs button, you would get a prompt that looks something like this, right? And it says essentially, hey, you know, Google Docs, they want access to read, uh, send, delete, and manage your email, and also they want to be able to manage your contacts. And so to maybe, you know, security people here, you're like, I wouldn't fall for that. Like, I know what I'm doing. Uh, but for the average, you know, user, they're like, oh, you know, Google, you know, Google Docs wants access to my Gmail. Aren't they the same thing? That seems fine. Uh, so you know, a lot of people did that. And if you were to authorize this prompt, the very next thing that it would go and do is read your 1,000 most recent contacts. And it would then propagate itself in the same way that you received your phishing email. It would use your account to send it to all of your coworkers or your friends. And it would continue the cycle all over again, right? You can sort of remember this from some of the email campaigns of the 90s, right? Worms of that nature. But this is a more modern version. So what is the you know, impact of this? Uh, this actually spread extremely quickly. It affected over a million Google users. And this is not just like personal accounts. This is like enterprise users on like corporate networks. This is like, you know, average, you know, everybody, uh, you know, your, your friends or whatever. And so it affects like both sides of the fence. And uh, while Google responded like pretty rapidly, like they realized this is a really bad deal, um, it still took them a couple hours to fix it. And even in that time, we saw this rapid spread, right? So uh, post-mortem uh, analysis essentially indicated that this was not an APT-style attack. It was actually pretty amateur for the most part. A lot of the code was copied from like Stack Overflow. So it actually could have been a lot worse. So breaking down some of these attack components, we have some you know, advanced traits, things like they had multiple rotating like domains and you know, uh, OAuth IDs uh, that they had created to sort of make it hard for Google to go and block them. You know, if they had one domain or one app, Google would just be like, oh, OK, uh, we'll block this app and we'll block this domain and the attack is over. Uh, so they actually did this. They, they, wrote, they had multiple um, you know, uh, IDs and domains to get around this, which complicated the remediation effort, um, which it's fairly advanced. They had uh, what's called an IDM homograph attack in the app name. That is just to say that, you know, you saw previously it had the word like, you know, hey, Google Docs is requesting this permission. One of those characters is actually a Unicode character, you know, like say the Swedish O or something, right? And it looks exactly like it's, you know, US equivalent, uh, but to the, you know, it's not the exact word, so it gets past like a basic filter that prevents them from setting a name that looks like an actual Google service. Uh, in addition, you know, we saw this already. It uses some clever social engineering tactics, right? It comes with this like sort of clever pretext about your friend sending you a Google Doc, which you pretty expect, and that helped greatly with its spread. So unsurprisingly, the, after you know this thing spread, a lot of people and a lot of companies were like, "This is really bad. I want to prevent this from happening in the future." You know, what can like uh, they demanded a lot of change in how sort of the OAuth system worked at Google and some changes to help or like uh, companies uh, protect themselves. So around two months later, uh, Google basically introduced something for sort of the G Suite administrators. So you can think of like people that run G Suite at companies protecting their employees. And this protection essentially allowed them to say, like, okay, all the employees in my company, they can only authorize specific apps 
for, to, for permissions on their account, and I have to explicitly say what those are. So you could say, like, I have 10 apps that I trust. None of my employees outside of those 10 apps can authorize access to their, you know, Gmail, Drive, whatever it is. And so in addition to this, they also crack down heavily on usage of what are called scopes, right, those permissions I mentioned earlier, like, ac like access to Drive, uh, Docs, whatever it is. And they put basically these new categories in place. And so how this works is essentially if you're trying to access something that's a sensitive quote unquote scope, uh, you have to go through like some intense uh, review and there's more warnings that get shown to you such as the quote unquote unverified app warning. And we'll see an example of that uh, in a little bit here. And as well as that, they you know, did, did a crackdown on all the existing uh, misleading OAuth apps to try to make their ecosystem a little bit more you know, cleaned out. Some quick food for thought here. Um, you know, you, we saw the previous attack, you saw the impact, right? But uh, it didn't have any crazy zero days that we would normally associate with a hugely successful worm, right? You normally expect like some crazy zero day, an email client, or you know something like that to before you see you know attacks succeed at this level. Uh, but this really didn't utilize a lot of those, apart from the Unicode trickery. There wasn't anything super special like that. But the impact was still substantial. So that's something that I like to point out as sort of one of the central themes of the talk is that you don't necessarily need crazy zero days to pull off big attacks. Sometimes just understanding the systemic issues of the platform is more than enough to pull off stuff like this. So uh, we talked about some of the stuff that they've added, but let's talk about sort of in the modern day with all these new protections, you know, what can we do still as attackers? I mentioned before we had the uh, unverified app prompt. This is what that looks like. I know many of you sort of think, oh, a prompt, maybe a user will just click past it, right? A lot of users are annoyed by computers constantly telling them what they can't do. I want this email right now. I'm going to click past things. Um, this is quite a more heavy handed uh, system. So it's, they take some lessons, I think, from Chrome's SSL warnings, where the user has to like click through not like basically tiny text to show more advanced options, and then actually click like, you know, all right, I actually really, really do want to go through before they can even get to the allow permission prompt. So this is actually like a significant hurdle for us as attackers. If we send this to a victim, they are, you know, if they're, you know, not a super strong technical user, they may not be able to get past the prompt at all. They may be like, I don't know what I'm doing here. So I mentioned previously sensitive and restricted scopes, right? Uh, and this is basically any, any permission which has access to private, you know, user data or, what, or something like that, right? So you can imagine for most Google services that applies. And so naturally this means it's like over 120 APIs fall under this kind of like, you know, cloak of like sensitive or restricted. So the way that this works essentially is if, you, if these scopes fall in this category and your app requests them from a user, now if your app has less than 100 users, you'll get that unverified prompt I showed you before, which is going to be very hard for users to click through. Um, if they have more than 100 users, it's actually even more strict. So uh, you actually have to go through a manual review process done by Google. And that is uh, such a, a stringent review process that even people who legitimately want the access, they uh, you know, have trouble getting it. So companies whose entire app is built around one piece of functionality, they've even written posts complaining like it's very hard to get past this approval process. So that's not likely a tenable route for us, right? But there are some exceptions. So if you read the uh, documentation for this, they say like, okay, when does this unverified prompt occur? And they have sort of this table which you don't have to read through. But essentially if you look at the intersection of these two points, this is the one that we're particularly interested in. And so the way that this works essentially is if your app requests one of these you know, quote unquote sensitive scopes, uh, if the person who creates this app, so the publisher of the app itself, and the user who is then authorizing this app's access to their own account, if they're in the same G Suite domain, the prompt isn't shown. And you can think about this like, you know, logically speaking, you're like, okay, you know, if my coworker makes an app and they, you know, to automate something internally and they send it to me, do we really need the same level of strictness, right? Do we need the unverified app prompt? It's an internal thing. We're all kind of trusted here, right? So that's kind of the logic behind this. So another thing to note about app script is uh, it doesn't have to be its own script. It can actually be attached um, to what's called a container. And what that means is essentially it's just some app script that's attached to a doc or a slides or a you know, Google sheet or something like that. And it basically um, it's, autom it's like bound to it and the execution allows it to like modify the sheet or the doc or whatever, you know, um, and it can trigger it when people like open the doc, for example. 
And so the way that this works essentially is if you have some app scripts, say, attached to a Google Doc, and you send it to somebody else, uh, you have to essentially share editor access to the doc in order for them to be able to you know, execute the app script attached to it. Uh, but otherwise, it works very much the same way as a regular app script. So if we imagine ourselves like as an external attacker, we're trying to attack an organization. You know, we have to first grant them editor access to the doc. We attach some app script and we send it to our you know victim who's inside of this org that we're trying to compromise, uh, and they open it. But you know, like I said, they'll normally get this. You know, hey, this app isn't verified. Are you sure you want to do it? You know, do some magic clicks to get around this. So it's likely to fail because the user is probably going to be like, I don't know how to get past this, or I'm very sketched out by the huge warning. So another very interesting trick that you can perform is uh, when you have sort of like your, you know, your Google Sheet or Doc or Slides link, normally it ends in that little forward slash edit that you're probably familiar with. Um, but that's actually not the only you know, uh, suffix that you can have. You can actually change it to uh, copy instead. And when you send a link with copy at the end uh, to the Doc, the user will instead get this prompt instead of you know, opening to the regular edit menu that you would expect. So you can see here it essentially says like, hey, you know, would you like to make a copy of quote confidential org wide conf and promo details? Something that I, the victim, am very nosy and would love to know. And when they click this make a copy button, essentially what this will do is it will copy it into their uh, drive and then they will immediately take them to the edit dialog. So like it makes a copy into their own drive and then they immediately can edit it. So now if we try this attempt, right, we're the external attacker, we send this link to the victim, they click the copy button. Now when they go and they actually activate the trigger and this spawns this access request prompt, suddenly we're not getting that warning that we were talking about previously. But why exactly is that? And so if we examine the actual permission prompt a bit more closely, we can actually find the answer. So if you look at who the developer is in this little prompt, you find out that the developer is actually the victim themselves. And so wait a minute, like why, why is that? Uh, the reason is because when they actually do the click make a copy button, uh, it actually copies the document into their own Google Drive. And when it does that, they become the creator, right? Because they've copied the document, they put it in their own drive, they are now the owner. And so you basically, they are now the creator of not just the document, but also the script attached itself. And so the person who's requesting the permission from the victim is the victim themselves. And they're both in the same G Suite org, so that validates the check that we were talking about before. And so this is what bypasses that check. But we have a problem. So if we do this copy, we run into this situation where if we have triggers that are attached to our document that are supposed to run, the triggers don't get copied over, which is kind of annoying. So now we need the victim to be able to trigger our script so that we can actually get this prompt to show up. Uh, but the triggers aren't being copied, so what should we do? So one of the useful uh, features of Google Sheets is that you can essentially declare what are called macros. You can sort of think of this as like Google's uh, version of uh, you know, the classic Excel, you know, VB script style stuff. And what this does is essentially you can declare macros which allow you to basically call arbitrary app script in the background. And what's more useful is you can actually have a macro where you can take an image or some other item and when they click on that, it'll actually trigger the macro which by proxy triggers the app script in your, you know, the script attached to the document. So this becomes a very useful way to get your victim to actually trigger your, uh, you know, your payload and it will also survive copying. Here's a quick proof of concept video showing this. We see the victim, they click, you know, make a copy of this Google Sheets and when they do this, it again gets copied into their Google Drive. They immediately come to the edit menu and they get this very trustable goose picture. You know, they go to click on it. And when they do, they get an authorization require prompt. And when they click through that, they see the regular permission prompt, right? No warnings, none of that. Um, we're back to square one. But that's actually not all that we've bypassed with using this technique. It's actually even better. So recall I mentioned previously, uh, Google also introduced the protection which says, hey, you know, G Suite administrators, now you can basically limit what permissions your employees can delegate to third party apps to only a specific list of apps that you trust. Well, this actually also gets past that as well because this is uh, quote like third party app protection, whereas this isn't third party, it's owned by the victim. So again, it's internal and it bypasses that check as well. So in doing this, we bypass both the unverified app prompts and the other internal administrative restriction, right? So again, back to square one without these protections enabled. <laughs> 
So another even more fun tip for defeating sort of these two protections that I mentioned is that uh, you, if we go and we read the docs, uh, we learn something, uh, again, very interesting. So when you have, uh, you know, a Google Doc and you have some app scripts attached to it, uh, one of the things you sort of ask yourself is like, okay, so uh, if, I, if I own a, if I create a Google Doc, um, am I the owner and creator of the script attached to it? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, you're, the, you're the owner and creator of both. So now we run into an interesting situation where if somebody creates a, a doc, you know, inside of a, G suite, a private G Suite domain and they share edit access with anybody outside of the organization, that person can basically not only edit the document itself, but they can go and they can add app script too. And when they add that app script, not, this app script that's added is not run as the person who just made this edit, it's as the original owner. So if you can find any publicly facing like documents or sheets or whatever on, you know, Google, uh, on G Suite, uh, you can actually add app script into them and bypass all of these checks as well. So just by creating these on a regular basis and sharing them externally, they've already created uh, essentially more avenues to bypass this. Cool. So we talked about piercing sort of the you know external perimeter, but once you're actually on the inside, now we want to like sort of like you know we want to pivot around, we want to escalate our privileges, all that good stuff. How can we go about doing that? So likely one place that you're all interested in once you've made your initial compromise is probably the good stuff is, is potentially in Google Cloud, right? If they're on top of G Suite, they probably use Google Cloud as well. They're all in on Google. And so you want to head there and get where the good data is, right? If it's a tech company, that's where their servers are. That's where the databases are. That's where all the fun is. So can we uh, actually access, can we fish uh, access to Google Cloud through AppScript? The answer is yes but it's not so obvious. So there is a scope essentially for, you know, what's called the qu qu uh, cloud platform scope. And you can see that has this tiny little permission uh, warning here, like with description of it, which isn't super alarming. Uh, and essentially if you authorize this scope, it means like wide access to Google Cloud. Any Google uh, Cloud service, you have full access to it on behalf of the user. So you can basically go in as the victim and access all the projects and, you know, various resources they have access to. And what you can do is you can basically use uh, what's called the script app that get OAuth token function call. And the token that's returned by that, you can put inside of an authorization bearer header and you can use that to make any you know, sort of API request to all of the various Google Cloud APIs. However, when you do this, you're going to quickly notice something that's a bit weird. So when you issue an API request with this token in the authorization bearer header, you're going to get this uh, error back that's going to confuse you. So in this case, we're trying to access the IAM API, and we get this weird error that says, uh, hey, um, you know, this API has not been used in the project before, so it's not enabled, or perhaps somebody disabled it. Um, what's even more perplexing is the ID number for the project. It's not, probably not, it's not gonna be the one that you were actually requesting. It's some other one that you don't even know what it is. So, you know, what the hell's going on here? So this is not super documented, but actually, whenever you create a new app script project, you are actually invisibly creating an entire Google Cloud project behind the scenes. And inside of a Google domain, this is actually an internal Google Cloud project that's created. Um, and this is magically bound to your project. So when you make API requests, uh, this essentially is like automatically your app script project is bound to this Google Cloud project. And so you, your request will essentially assume that you mean in the context of this Google Cloud project. And that's why you're getting that error we saw before. It's the, the product number is actually for the you know, special hidden one that's actually available to you that was created when you created your app script project. So that's annoying. How can we get around this? Well, it turns out you can specify what's called the x-google-user-project header, uh, followed by whatever, you know, the internal Google Cloud uh, project that you want to access is. And this will allow you to essentially, you know, bypass this protection. Or not protection, sorry, this, like, weird functionality. So we see an API request over here where we're going to access a specific product ID. Not only do we specify the authorization bearer headers, but we also specify this, you know, project header I mentioned before. And we specify the project ID we're trying to access. And this will succeed as expected, right? So you can use this to pivot totally inside of Google Cloud and get access to all the stuff that you're expecting, right? So anything your user has access to, you now have access to as well. If the data you're looking for is not in Google Cloud, it's probably in Google Drive because, you know, say you're not like a tech company that has servers and software and all this stuff running in Google Cloud, maybe you're a finance company, uh, it's probably in Google Drive instead. So how can we get access to that stuff? 
So we'll take a moment to talk about uh, sharing in Google Drive, which is a sort of a unique ACL system. There's essentially sort of three levels that you can do when it comes to sharing items in Google Drive. And so the most restricted version is essentially, you know, what's quote unquote restricted. This means like, you know, you have to individually add every single user that want, needs access to this item. Uh, and, you know, everybody who's not on this explicit list can't access it. Uh, the next level, uh, some of you are probably familiar with essentially, it's uh, shared by link. So only if you actually already have the link or have knowledge of the link can you access it. Otherwise, you can't find it. So that means like internally in an org, if somebody's like searching in the Google Drive search bar, it won't come up. It won't be indexed for them unless they've already viewed the doc once. And then there's actually even a wider setting that you can do where you can say not only if they have the link, but also if they're just searching in their Google Drive page and they use some relevant keywords, they can find it. But that requires a few extra clicks. So, you know, sort of by default in this world, you, you know, you're essentially sharing with the entire organization by link alone is just one click away. And sharing a searchable version is essentially two clicks away. And uh, like I mentioned before, they view it once, it's searchable in the future. And unfortunately, these URLs, right, if you share by link, uh, they're not brute forceable. You're not going to be able to just like, you know, cast, you know, break away the entropy and be able to brute force your way a link. You have to actually have it or have some way to find it, right? So what can we do here? In the real world, this is, you know, how people use this is, you know, there's sort of like what the technical controls are and there's like in practice, what does this actually look like? Uh, in practice, what happens like in the bulk of cases is that, you know, you say you have a, a by, you know, a valuable doc or something that's important, sort of by definition, if it's, you know, quote unquote important, it's going to be the one that's shared with other people at the org, right? If it's a spreadsheet or a presentation, they're going to be sharing it with a bunch of different individuals to take a look at. And it turns out that, you know, adding one by one people to ACLs is a very tedious process. You do it for like 10 people and then you're like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Like people are constantly requesting access. I'm like granting it. This is going to suck up my whole life. Uh, I'm just going to share it by link anyways. So in practice, share by link becomes a very, very common uh, option for people. So how can we get access to these, you know, documents that are shared via, you know, sort of the share by link functionality? So as a starting point, of course, we can, you know, take a look at any internal systems that there are, things like chat systems, things like, you know, bug trackers, anything internally that they have to find, a f you know, some seed links. And um, that's a good starting place for sure. But, you know, a wide, a wide variety of them won't be posted there. And so uh, one other way that we can find these is basically doing what we do on the web, right? When we want to find a document on the web, quote unquote, uh, essentially, the way that it works is we have these spiders which will go through all these web pages. They'll recursively crawl those links. They'll crawl them and sort of enumerate all of them. And the same, you know, sort of functionality works when it comes to Google Drive. You can go through, like, an example Google Doc. You can pull out all the links in that Google Doc. And if they link to other documents like sheets or slides or whatever it is, uh, you can then recursively parse those as well. And in practice, this ends up being a very useful way to find, you know, new links and new documents that you previously didn't know about that are shared by link, and, f and by proxy find more data. So in order to sort of exploit this functionality, uh, I've written uh, an app script spider, which essentially you, know, you provide it with some seed documents. It'll do exactly as I described. It'll parse through them, get links, recursively crawl them, and it will essentially dump a huge spreadsheet of all of, it, all of the documents that it was able to enumerate. So this becomes a very useful thing when you want to find as much data as possible in Google Drive, and you don't want to take the manual time of trying to click through and find every single link in Docs. So you can find that at this repository, which I totally finished and published an hour before the talk. So take a look at that. Uh, another useful thing uh, when it comes to, you know, app script phishing and sort of this stuff is uh, essentially what's called the, the people API. So if you're going to request some scopes that you're going to fish out of your user to get them to authorize, one of the ones that I definitely recommend is what's called the people API. Uh, it's sort of uh, a, a lesser known f feature of G Suite. And the way this works essentially is uh, G Suite by default sort of comes with this like really nice internal employee directory. And this allows you to actually enumerate all of the other people working, you know, at your quote unquote company inside of your G Suite domain. And it has things like their email address, you know, their sometimes more details like their title, stuff like that. And it becomes a very useful thing to, you know, snag a quick copy of when you have uh, access to a victim. Because you can so essentially take this and say you get pulled out, like DNR comes in and they say, what is this, you know, <laughs> this malicious app revokes it from their account. Uh, if you get a copy of this, you actually have a very useful resource for saying, okay, I want to do another spear phishing attack, but now I have all the org structure, 
and I can use this to perform a much better version of that, right? You know, who works in finance or HR or whoever it is, right? So I highly recommend this as a way to sort of have a back route back in. So uh, let's talk about, you know, privilege escalation, right? So we talked about sort of like digging up stuff, enumeration, pivoting around. Let's talk about increasing our privilege level. So uh, we're going to remember what I talked about a little bit earlier where you can have essentially Google Docs and Sheets and you have AppScript that's actually attached to them. Uh, we're going to sort of look into how this actually works, right? So remember I mentioned they could be bound. Um, how does it work exactly? If you have a Google Doc and it has some AppScript attached to it, um, does the actual Google Doc itself and the script that's attached to it, like do they have the same ACLs? Like if I share edit access to a Google Doc, does the script attached to it, is it also editable by whoever I shared it with? Is that a separate ACL? How does that work, right? So again, if you go to the useful docs, you'll see that actually there is no difference in the ACLs between them. Uh, anybody who is an editor of a doc is also the editor of the script attached to the doc. Uh, they can edit, modify, add, add whatever they want, then that works just fine. There's no distinction, which is, you know, a much more simple system. But this brings up another question, right? Because remember, if I want somebody to actually trigger my app script, if I want to make my app script usable in any way, uh, I have to give them edit access to do that. Uh, so this creates a very interesting problem, right? Say I make an internal app script app, I make it for my coworkers to automate their lives. Um, now, in order for them to actually use it, I have to make them editors of the document or, you know, sheet or whatever it is, but now they have access to the script as well. And that doesn't really sound great, right? How does that work? So we can imagine this situation, right? You have, say, a Google Doc with some script you share with your coworkers so that they can automate their, you know, Google Cloud or Docs, whatever it is. But a malicious user also has edit access to the doc. They can come in and they can edit the script attached to the doc to be, you know, arbitrary. They can add some extra special code in the middle to say, hey, send me an access token for that user, you know, pump all the docs out, whatever it is. Um, and then when the other users come in and they invoke the trigger as a part of the regular, you know, sort of usage of this, uh, when they do that, they will run your, the attacker's malicious script and the attacker will be able to execute, you know, the script as them with what other permissions, whatever permissions were requested by this app, right? So not great. But, you know, as attackers, we're often very impatient. I don't want to wait around for somebody to re-trigger what I'm doing, right? I don't want to say, like, all right, well, I'll wait till they use this random internal app again and then I'll compromise them. I want to, like, do a script as them now. So there's actually a way to do one better. So it turns out that we can actually force them to re-trigger this script by using what's called uh, web uh, endpoints. And so you can actually like publish the app script trigger as a web endpoint that is like essentially a URL that they can visit. And when this person uh, visits this link, it'll automatically trigger the script as them and it will run uh, with their permissions and the scopes requested by the app. But it's actually even better. They don't have to visit the link directly. They can visit any web page that links to it with like an image tag or a style sheet, and that you know sub resource trigger works just as well. So they can you can send them to any web page that includes it as an image, for example, and that will automatically trigger it with their you know uh, permissions and stuff. As so you can use this to immediately re-trigger your payload. So the way you do that essentially is under the app script editor, you do a new deployment, you select the web app type, you deploy it just like this, and you get this URL back. And essentially this is the URL you can use inside of your image tags or whatever else it is to get, you know, your victims to run it again. Cool. So let's talk about some more lateral movement techniques. Um, some of you are probably familiar with what's called Google Groups. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how they work for, you know, in the context of ACLs. So Google Groups is often promoted not just as a way to say, hey, here's how to create an email list that you can, you know, email like these people and get the same group of people. Uh, but they're often promoted as a uh, very useful ACL system. So they say, hey, you want to gain access to a doc or some Google Cloud resources, just create a Google group. And you just add the uh, pro appropriate users. And when you do that, you can basically, you know, have a good gating functionality to build these ACL policies, right? Uh, but there is one issue. In G Suite by default, all created Google groups are sort of open by default. So when you create one, Anybody internally can find this Google group via search and they can just join it without any sort of problem. You have to actually go in and impl implicitly lock it down and to say like, no, people can't join it, people can't do this, right? So on their own, that's, 
not terrible, but together it's really not great, right? Because now the, the default for every single person that wants to use this as an ACL, they're now going to create a vulnerability, right? Unless they explicitly take extra steps not to. And we know that when the default is bad, in practice, many, many vulnerabilities get created, right? It ends up being sort of an endless privilege escalation factory. And so this is very useful to us as attackers when we're trying to sort of improve our permissions. So, you, you know, okay, it's an ACL system, but what's actually gated by this? Um, it's gated by, you can use it to gate Google Cloud, you can use it to gate all the stuff in Google Drive, uh, you can make a, even admin, G Suite admin policies that are gated by Google Groups, Calendar, you know, you can even publishing Chrome extensions is, can be gated via Google Groups. So the possibilities are actually quite endless. So uh, I'm going to make a quick distinction here. There's some functionality that's available to the, on the API level versus like sort of if you have the full account, you're going to click around manually in the account. And so like for AppScript, for example, we don't have, you know, we have access via the APIs, right? So I'm going to talk about some stuff that's accessible only via the API. And so when you see that, think like, okay, my implant can do this. And then, so, you know, the other stuff, you think, okay, I actually have uh, login access to this account, and this is what I can do. So what can we actually access, like, say, if we have an implant in AppScript, right? Well, when it comes to Google Groups, uh, modifying it is not as easy as it sounds. Um, the actual API is restricted to, you know, sort of explicitly stuff created by the administrator of a domain. Um, but there is something called the Google Cloud Identity API, which by proxy allows you to sort of edit uh, Google Groups via the API. So what can you do via this API? Uh, you can list all the Google Groups in an organization. You can list all of their members, what roles they are. And you can also create and manage and update your own Google Groups. But the sad sadly, one of the things you can't do is you can't join the open Google Groups via the implant, which is very sad because it would be very helpful in the previous case. But, uh, you know, of course, if you have the full level access to the account, you would be able to do that. Cool. So we've talked about internal privilege escalation. You know, we talked about like getting getting into perimeter, all that good stuff, pivoting around. Let's talk about sort of like you know backdooring stuff, uh, stealth and persistence. So we'll go into some interesting Gmail trickery that's useful. Uh, when you have API access to Gmail, one of the useful things that you're probably going to immediately want to do with your implant is create what are called Gmail filters. Gmail filters are an incredibly useful tool for email, which will allow you to essentially say, hey, here's a, you know, a matching rule. If an email matches this format, in this example, it's like no reply to accounts like google.com, and it has the subject security alert, just, just, just throw that in the trash, or throw that in their all mail. Don't, don't show it to the user. Uh, so you can essentially use this to hide all of these sort of warnings that they would normally get to sort of make yourself a bit more stealthy so they don't see like, for example, the, you know, the warning email you get when you authorize a new app. You can just say, shh, no, we'll get rid of that. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, people's email accounts tend to be the center of their world. Uh, you know, all of their email accounts essentially, or sorry, all of their random internet accounts, they use their email address as sort of their centralized source of trust. So if you have access to their email, you can do a password reset on their accounts and gain access to those by proxy. So this becomes a very useful thing where you can sort of send, you can create an app script, or you can create a Gmail filter that essentially says, hey, hide any password reset emails. And then you can use your, your app script implant to then actually pull the emails themselves and use this to sort of like silently, in the background, slowly take over their connected accounts. Uh, so there's another piece of functionality which is called essentially uh, delegates and forwarding addresses. And this isn't available via the API, sadly, but it is useful to know about if you have full, you know, the login to a specific account and you want to use this, right? So if you have like the what's quote unquote manual access, the full level access to their account, uh, you can do, you can create what are called forwarding addresses. And so these are like essentially you can create a filter that says like, hey, email comes in. Why don't you just take that email and forward it to my remote mailbox at attacker at yahoo.com, right? And it doesn't have to be a filter. It can just be every single email they've ever received. They receive. Uh, and then what happens essentially is like anything that matches this just gets silently sent off. So this is a very useful way to essentially persist their account. If you were to get revoked or their password changed or whatever it is, uh, this will still allow you to essentially get, you know, sort of invisibly CC'd on all of the emails that they get going forward, which can be, you know, almost as good as like what you originally had. So uh, remember we talked a little bit before about that first attack where they had this like Unicode trickery in the name. Um, there are some protections that they changed that you can't essentially change your app name to be as deceptive as it was before. You can't just set Google Docs as the name, even if you use your fancy Unicode characters. So you can see this little proof of concept here. I set my project name to, you know, Google Docs, and I try to rename it to that. 
But when I go to the authorization prompt, it's just called Untitled Project because Google, you know, AppScript's like, no, I know what you're trying to do. You can't name it something that's a Google service, right? So what can we do here? So as I mentioned, they've eliminated a lot of our you know, regularly useful routes, no Unicode characters, no no width spaces, none of those fun tricks. Uh, but one useful thing that was not included in this change was using what's called the right to left override character. So for those of you that aren't familiar, you know, in English, you know, in English when we write, we write left to right. But in other languages, they'll actually write, you know, right to left. And so there's a special Unicode character that you can use, and when you input that in, it will actually change the position of the resulting text. And so this allows you to essentially reverse the name of the app, and so all the characters you type in, type in going forward will now actually be printed out in reverse. So we can see in my example here, I have, uh, you know, essentially I basically paste in that Unicode character, and then I actually type in Google Docs, but backwards. And because of this Unicode character, it will reverse it. And so to the user, it will look, you know, basically like it's just regular Google Docs, right? And so when you actually see I go to the prompt, it says Google Docs, just like this initial attack did, and we bypass all of this protection. Another useful thing that you're almost certainly going to want to do is you don't want one-time access to an account. You want perpetual access. You want to access their account going forward. You want to use their account to like snoop around. You want to be able to do this for a long time. And so there's essentially this, uh, with the way the ASCript works is you can essentially create these, you know, quote unquote cron jobs, these scheduled executions. And those will run on a time basis allowing for background execution in the future. And they can be run as often as every minute. If you read the docs, though, they, they say something very interesting. They say, hey, if you're going to run something in the background perpetually, you have to declare this scope. And that scope, when, you know, when, it's, when it's actually used, is going to show this extra warning prompt to the user that says, hey, user, uh, this is going to run in the background. Do you sure you want this to run forever? Like, that's pretty serious. Um, but that's what the docs say. Uh, and what the docs say and what actually happens is not always the same thing. It turns out this is more of a guideline than it is a hard rule. Uh, if you programmatically create this trigger and you, you know, declare uh, require even one more scope, uh, this is totally not necessary. You cannot set this scope at all. You can just declare one other scope, and basically you can programmatically create a time trigger, and that works completely fine. Uh, so it's completely unnecessary to request it, and uh, you can essentially persist indefinitely, no extra warnings, and have access to the account going forward. So always test to see if the difference between what's said is true and what actually is the case, because you'll find a lot of very interesting stuff that way. And that's it. Hope you've all enjoyed the talk.